God, you asked me for all and I gave you some. I gave you part. But even when I gave you part, you still gave me all. I don't want to know church. I don't want to know religion. I don't want to, I don't want my pastor to know it for me. I don't want my mom to know. I need to know you because my life matters. Let's read. It says this in Psalms 39, uh, verse number four. It says, show me, O Lord, my life's end and the numbers of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made all the days a mere hand breath and a span of my years as nothing before you. Another, another version says, my life is but a vapor. A vapor. That's it. That's your life. Isn't that what we're doing? We're grasping for that life. This life on earth is but a hand breath or a vapor. We are living everything for the vapor and missing the bigger picture. Don't let the devil blind you. There is so much more to life than life. <laughs> what we do with the vapor will determine eternity. How we live eternity will be determined by the vapor. Show me, O oh Lord, my life's end and the numbers of my day. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Verse 5, you have made my days a mere handbreadth, a span of my years is nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Everyone breathe. Ready? One, two, three. <sighs> That's each man's life. Each woman's life is but a breath. You say, Pastor, this is getting depressing. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about only in vain. He heaps up wealth not knowing who will get it. Have you ever thought about that? Someone's going to drive your car one day if it's still good. Have you ever thought about this? Someone will live in that house that you're building. Someone will wear your clothes if they come back in style. Someone will love on your family. We hustle and bustle for this life, yet not knowing who will get it. But now, Lord, what do I look for? If I'm not supposed to look at the vapor, what do I look for? David says, my hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make my life the scorn of fools. God, if I'm going to live life, I don't want to look at it for the rest of eternity and think that life was the scorn of fools. What was my vapor but just to fulfill me? And I enjoyed it for, you know, some people, you see that old guy in that, that Ferrari driving and you're like, dude, it would have been nice if he was 19. Now he can barely see the road. He finally got there. Right? And here's, not, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying wealth is bad. I'm saying it's bad when wealth has you. It's not bad to have stuff. It's when stuff has me more than he has me. And so what we do is we say, thank God for all this stuff. But God, if you want any of it, it's yours. I don't need it. Look, all I need is it's not Jesus and the nice house. It's not Jesus and I got everything worked out. It's G. I just need you. Anything less will be a letdown for what God has for your life. YOLO. You only live once. Did you know that in heaven, you know how God considers gold in heaven? Let me just read this to you. Revelations 21 says this, there are 12 gates, there were 12 pearls, each gate was, was one pearl, and the streets of the city were pure gold. So look at this, the streets of the city 
was not like fool's gold, was not like half a carat gold, was pure gold, the purest you could find. And so when I used to read this, I thought, wow, that's awesome. Heaven is balling. I can't wait to get to heaven. It's, it's got pure gold. But what God's trying to tell us, because I was thinking about this for a while. I said, why, why, do you say, why do you say the streets are made of gold? God's like, look, I'm trying to tell you that what you think is so valuable on earth is the asphalt in heaven. What you're so focused on getting more of, if you knew how valuable it is here, you would realize it's what we walk on. It's what we drive on. It has no value here. Look, so, so we spend our whole life working to get a pile of asphalt. Well, I'm trading my asphalt in today. I'm saying, God, I want real riches. I want real treasure. I want what you really have for me. I, it's not that I don't need asphalt. I just need to know what it is. It's not, I'm not telling you to burn your gold. I'm telling you to drive on it. Use it to get you from one point to the next. But make sure that point you're going to is to follow Christ, is to be after his call on your life, is to do what he called you to do, to make an impact with your vapor that counts and leaves a smell in the room. Okay, good. I'm, I'm preaching more than some people are shouting, but that's okay. This is not probably a shouting message. It's going to hit you all at once. I, 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 I want to I I remind you, um, that, that, let's, let's, go over, let's go over to 2 John. Uh, 2 John, you say, why, why does this matter? Why are you telling us? I, I just don't want, you to, I don't want you to be shocked when you get there. 2 John chapter, uh, chapter 8. Let's look at this. 2 John chapter 8, 1 verse 8. It says, it says this. You ready? Look to yourselves that you do not lose those things which we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. So, so when we get to heaven, God's saying, look at what you're doing. Look at what you're working for so that you don't miss it and, and you may receive a full reward. Someone say full reward. Okay, so, so if, if there's a full reward for some, then there's a partial reward for others and a no reward for some. So, so watch what you're doing because when we get to heaven, there's a reward for those that live a certain way. You say, well, I thought we, I thought we weren't living for works. No, we're not. But, but because of our salvation, we will work. If our salvation works, there will be things that we do with our hands. Don't, I, you're not saved because of your works, but because you're saved, you will work. There is things you will do with your life. Jesus didn't pay for us so we can sit around and wait for him to come back. He paid for our lives. And then if, if that was it, he would have took us right then and we would be in heaven. He misses us. He wants to be with us. He wants to see us face to face. But he left me here for this 80 years that feels like forever to me, but is instant to him so that I could return the favor. What are you and I doing with what he gave us? He gave us a second chance. And we will either receive a partial reward, a no reward, or a full reward. Now, now um, I, I know you know that Jesus is a, is a savior, but do you know that he's also Lord? And that that Lord is not just the Savior, but he's also a judge. I know it's not popular to talk about judgment because you're used to others judging you. And they got a plank in their eye while they're trying to get the, they get, they're trying to get the speck out of yours. So it doesn't work out too well. But, but my Bible says that the Father God has given Jesus the position of judge. One day, all of us, individually, will stand before Savior and Judge Jesus. Not Judge Judy. She might let you off. Might let me work around some, but, but Judge Jesus. He said, man, I don't want him to be judge. Well, he's just. And to be just, he's the only one he can count on to rule justly. So in his justice, he made himself judge. 
And so he's, he's going to judge us. And, and so, you know, I know we don't talk about this a lot, but there are a lot of the word judgment is in the Bible a lot. In fact, there, there are several times that the earth was judged. Uh, remember when Adam and Eve messed up, God showed up in the garden as judge. And, and, and because of their sin, they were kicked out of the garden. They wanted to be in the garden. No matter how naked they were and how afraid they were, they wanted to be in there. But the judge came in and says, because of your choice, you were removed from the garden. The first Adam, Adam messed up. And he got kicked out of the garden because of his disobedience. We're all in this mess. And so the first, first judgment of God was in the garden. And, and, then, and then we see, uh, remember the, Noah and the ark? Remember that moment? I mean, the earth was going and, and Noah was the only man in the whole, whole earth that was righteous, him and his family. And so God said, I'm sending a flood. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and, the, and the waters came up and the, the streams came down and Noah built an ark and God judged the earth and people died. People were lost in, 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 that, in that moment. I know we, we know Jesus, the Savior, but we, we can't remiss that God is also a judge. And this is not fun. This is not exciting. This is not shouting material. But I have to tell you this because you could miss your life and be ticked at me because when you're standing before Judge Jesus and you said, man, thank you, Pastor, for telling me he's Savior Jesus, but you never told me he was Judge Jesus. I wish someone would have told me. Well, I'm telling you now, he's Judge Jesus. And then the Tower of Babel, they started building to God. They didn't spread out like God told them to. And, and they started building their tower. And, and God came and he judged them. He, he split up their languages. He, 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 you know, this is why we have different dialects and different things. Genesis 11, 5 through 9. Um, he was the judge over Egypt. When Egypt would not let God's people go, there were, there were plagues and, I mean, crazy stuff. The river turned to blood. So we got to know that God, in his justice, is a judge. Somebody say this to me on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. God is a a judge. Thank God you're not my judge. Thank God my boss isn't my judge. Thank God I have a merciful judge. You know, God, God is a judge, but he is also rich in mercy. And mercy always triumphs over judgment. But if I'm going to be judged before the Lord as a believer, then I better prepare my life to give an account for how I lived it. Amen? Amen. 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 The cross was the judgment of our sin. So God the judge, the animals weren't doing. The animal sacrifice, so God said, I need a lamb that is spotless. I need the lamb that was slain before. And so Jesus, when he said, my father, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing the judgment of every sin we've ever committed. Every sin that would ever be committed, the, the, the judgment that God had against Hitler for what he did, the judgment from that person who molested you, the judgment from that, the worst possible sin. Jesus put the weight of the sin of the world on him and he said, Father, your judgment will kill them and they can't pay for this sin, so I take your judgment on this cross. This is why we have to receive the cross, the free gift. We can't earn it. We can't do something to get it. It's too heavy. And so God's judgment judged Jesus. It wasn't the nails that killed Jesus. What did he say on the cross? Into your hands I commit my spirit. He prayed and then he died. It wasn't the nails. It wasn't the guards. Jesus gave his life to the Father. He laid his life on the altar. He was judged in my place. And when I receive Christ, I get his payment on that cross. I, I get what he gave me that I couldn't earn myself. That's why I got to have Jesus in my life. Because I can't stand before God without him in view. Because without Jesus there, man, I just got religion. And religion will not stand up. Earning will not stand up. I can't do enough good stuff. I can't earn my way to the Father's love. Because He is a just, loving Father. 
And so, so there's the judgment of that. There is the judgment occurring now in this age. In the Bible, we can see in 1 Corinthians, they're talking to the people of God. When you take communion, don't just take it without first looking at your life, contemplating, am I, am I doing right in God's eyes? Am I living a pure life? Am I pursuing holiness? Because in their time, some people would take communion and they would get sick or they would die because they were, they were taking God's body, that symbol of God's body. And so they said, look, before you take communion you need to be considering this is why we're doing this we're remembering what he did for us and we're judging ourselves. we're looking at our life we're saying so every time we take communion in this church I'm not saying you're going to get sick if, if, if you take it without looking at your life but that opportunity is the opportunity for us to say hey God I'm looking at what you did on this cross for me and I am judging in the perspective of where I'm at to what you paid for am I living a life worthy of the call I received on that cross am I living a life that counts am I and and we and and here's the key we got to judge ourselves so we won't have to be judged before his throne you'd much rather look at yourself and go man I need to fix this I need to work on this and not that in my own strength I do I need to lay my life and say God look I don't know how to fix this I'm struggling with with this and I'm dealing with that but God I want to pursue righteousness I want to pursue love and when you pursue love he kicks fear out of your life he so 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 here's the best thing we can do not wait for God to judge us but to judge ourselves I know, I know you're good at judging others. No, not this group, huh? We're really good at judging others. Well, they're crazy. They, they, they got to get things together. Every time you hear a message, you heard it for 15 people in your life. And you're taking notes for them. You make sure they see that quote. I'm, you know, someone puts up a cool quote on Instagram. You reshare it. It's not for you. It's for that person that offended you, right? I mean, we judge. We judge others real well, but we don't judge ourselves real well. And so we need to look at our life. Look, this is the whole picture of the, of the person with the speck in their eye and the plank. God's saying, look, get the plank out of your eye so you can help others get the speck out of their eye. But the reality is we all got a plank in our eye. We all got stuff we can work on. Look, I'm not here to work on you. I'm just working on me. I can't change you. I can only submit my life to the one who changes me. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm not here at church for you. I'm here for me. I'm here to receive. And as I receive and I get transformed, then God calls me to serve. He calls me to, he calls me to be a clean vessel that he can use. Look, God's not trying to pull dirty cups out of the, out of the kitchen and serve them to people on a tray and say, wow, I got this awesome meal for you. Here's Deanna. And Deanna has not cleaned herself. Deanna has not, I can say that about Deanna because we all know Deanna's cleaning herself and preparing herself. But, But then the world's like, I don't want that. It's dirty. It's a mess. It looks just like my life. And so here we are in, in the house. And when we come in this room, we say, God, cleanse me. Cleanse my thoughts. Cle- cle- God, I'm just thinking crazy thoughts. We, we got we to begin to judge ourselves. And then one day, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us about it. And then another day, we'll stand before the great white throne of judgment. These are two, two places we'll stand and we either will be rewarded or everything we did will burn up. Can you imagine all this work that you're doing, that I'm doing, to at the end of life have nothing to show from it? That's, that's heavy. But we don't have to because we can choose right now to not build of, with straw or hay, but to build with precious stones, a life that echoes in eternity. It's not about just doing something. It's about doing what you're called to do. I, I, can I go deeper? Is that okay? 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us about these judgment seats. It says, for we are, we are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body is to be present for, with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim with present, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we all must appear, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Wow, we all must appear 
before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us, all of us. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I want to show you something else. Revelation 20, look at this, verse 11 says this, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on the throne. Then it says, The earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them to hide. Wow, that's intense. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And then it says, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. So there were books that were opened. I wish you could see it on the screen. Maybe it'll come up in a second. The books were opened, and then another book was opened. So how many books were opened? Two, two books, but how many books are in the beginning? I don't know. What I believe about this moment is that when the books are opened at the judgment seat of Christ, that books are opened is not the book of life. It's the book of your life. <laughs> that just hit some people. Because we thought we were just going to be in the Lamb's book of life, which we are. If you've received Jesus in your life, you're going to be in that second book. And you're going to spend all eternity with Jesus, not because of what you did, not because of your faith, but because you put your faith in him. And he said, God, I received that judgment you took on the cross, and I received life in exchange for judgment. And for all of eternity, you're going to be with Jesus because of that second book. But that first book, I believe, is going to be the book of Jeremy. Wow. It's going to be the book of David. God's going to say, we've got two books to look at, the Lamb's Book of Life. But first, before we get to the Lamb's Book of Life, because your name is in there, we're first going to open the book of David. Let me show you David, because the Bible says before one day came to be, God knit you together in your mother's womb. He formed your whole life. He wrote about it all in his book. He, he planned the whole thing. He does the, the, the end from the beginning. And so he knit you together. He planned your life. He determined your life. He got your call, your destiny. There's no use arguing about your destiny with God because it is set in heaven. He already has a book written about you. He has a book called Manny. Manny has no clue he has the book called Manny and he finally meets Jesus at 22. And at 22, when he meets Jesus, he receives salvation. And so most of us miss it because we think that's the end. It's really just the beginning. At this moment when we realize our name is written in that book, we're on the guest list now and, and we're, not just, we're not just barely made it. We are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are adopted into the family. We realize that this great God, we didn't end up here by accident. We didn't do it ourselves. God had planned that I would meet him at this moment and I would have the opportunity to say yes. I said yes, but he said yes first. And now what do I do? I just wait till I die, right? I just try to be a good person. I, no, no, go look for the book. Go, go read the book. There's a book written about your life. There's a book that will be open one day and it will say, Manny, at 21 years old, he begins day one. At 21, he's one because he's born again. So what happened from age one to when you go be home with Jesus? What's written in your book is written in your book. It doesn't change based on how you live here. It's already written. We can't change what God wrote. No matter how much we beg him, or I, it's written there. It is written for me. So, so what do I do with that? Because some of us are going to get to heaven and God's going to open the book and you're going to go, what? I had no clue. I didn't have the gifts for that. Wow. Oh, I was going to give them to you when you stepped out. I had these gifts where well, you, you didn't use them to the level that you could, if you would have started, you were going to grow in them and, and here's where you're going to do and you were going to lead to this and there, there were going to be a thousand saved here because you listened to me and a, a, a million saved here and, and you were going to, but God, what, but I didn't do any of that. So for all of eternity, we'll stare at this book that was written about us. We'll have made it, but like someone escaping a fire. Because everything we did, the book we made, 
is burned up. Anything we write in our book that is not what he wrote in his book is wasted. Wow, oh, man, Pastor, I was just coming to church trying to have a fun time. This is like, give me some coffee and stuff. And here you are talking about the book. Here's the good news. There is a book that is written about you that no man can take away. No eye has seen, no mind has conceived what God has for you, but the Holy Spirit. If you'll get with the Holy Spirit, he'll start telling you. I had no clue this was in my book. But I had to say yes to the first chapter. Okay. You know, the first chapter isn't always fun. It's not always the, it's like, okay, God, that's kind of boring. That's not what I'm ex expecting. No, God, I, I'm ready for whatever you have in my book. I'm ready for it. I'm excited for it. And the judge will stand before us. And he'll not judge us by what we did. He'll judge us by what we did in comparison to what we were called to do. What are you called to do? Are you doing what you were called to do? Are you just breathing? Are you just trying to make it? Are you just trying to survive 2020? Or are you thriving in this moment? Because God did not write a book about you of failure. You are a champion. You are a warrior. You are, you are sent here to change things. And how do I know that? Because you got Jesus living on the inside of you. He said, are you mad? No, I'm, I'm mad about him. And he has changed my life because I said yes to chapter one. Do we get off on the book? All the time. This is why we got to spend time with him. This is why we got to wake up in the morning and get more than a Sunday once a month encounter. This is why we got to get more than what our pastor can give 600 people. We got to hear his voice for us. We got to know what he's telling us. Don't do the thing that makes you the most money. Do the thing you're called to do. Take a moment to breathe. Don't just do it because they did it and they said I would be good at it. No, no, no. God, what have you called me to? What is my life going to echo through eternity? It's just a vapor. Why waste the vapor on pursuing something you can never hold? The gold you're chasing is the asphalt of heaven. Don't chase asphalt. Stop chasing asphalt. Stop pursuing the thing that isn't the thing. I want to show you a video. And this video is going to mess you up. It's going to go a little deeper. Four minutes long. I, I guarantee you it'll be the best four minutes you spent in a long time. Because when I watched it, both times I cried. At the end. Not saying you have to cry. But it will mess with your American Christianity. What are we living our life for? I have a thousand more scriptures. I don't have time to say them all. You got to come back next week. You got to get an X-18. We're going we're gonna to take this deeper and go deeper and learn more. And learn about this judgment seat I'm going to stand before and give an account to God by myself. My mom's not going to be there. My pastor's not going to be there. My friends aren't going to be there. I'm going to stand before him and he's going to look at the weight of my life. Not what I did. But did I do what I was called to do? How close did my life line up with the book? And based on that, I'm going to receive no reward. Everything in my life will be burned up. And I'll make it by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> Can you imagine making it all the way to, he to heaven and being like a homeless man in heaven? What if I told you the next 24 hours of your life how you live the next 24 hours of your life will determine the next 100 years of your life. What neighborhood you get to live in, what car you drive, what your bank account looks like. What if I took just 24 hours, how you live the next 24 hours according to what I've written for you to live, how close you live to that, and the next 24 hours will determine the next 100 years of your life. 
What if we took that further and, and you could live longer? And I said, well, the ne- how you live the next 24 minutes will determine how you live the next thousand years. How would you live, how would you live that 24 minutes? I mean, would you waste any of it? Would you lollygag? Would you just go, oh, whatever happens, happens. No, you, you would be like, at least I'm going to take this 24 minutes and try to live it the best I can in comparison to this. I may not, I may not succeed, but I got to try because this determines. Now, let's just, let's just take eternity. The Bible says we can't understand it in our mind. It's too big to fathom, but you can experience it in your heart. What is eternity in comparison to this 80 years? In comparison, this life is not a vapor. It's nothing. How I live this next 80 years will determine how I spend all of eternity. Wow. You say, I don't believe it. That's okay. You don't have to believe it. That doesn't change the facts. I used to have this friend. He he didn't know anything about cars, and he would drive up to visit me when I was... was, uh, a college student in Bethany Bible College and there's all these hills and stuff like that. He didn't know anything about cars. I didn't really know much about cars. But he didn't know that you have to change your oil every once in a while. He was driving up to my thing. He said, man, it's the weirdest thing. I, I get creeped out in these woods that, that are out here. He's a little different, you know. I get creeped out in these woods that are out here. And every time I come out here, there's like weird noises. There's noises in the dark on the certain hills. There's this one hill that every time I come up, it, my car even starts going crazy. I hear noises everywhere. And so what, what ended up happening is he said one night those noises got so loud, they landed on my car and stopped my car. I said, wow, that's crazy. And so we went and looked at his car and we found out his engine blew up. <laughs> there was no aliens. There was no stranger things in the dark. He didn't put oil on his car. Now he could say all day long, that's not fair. I didn't believe I had to put oil on my car. I didn't know I had to put oil on my car. It doesn't change the fact that if he doesn't put oil on the car, the car's going to break down. And it doesn't matter what he thinks it is. It is what it is. And the only way to change it is to fix what it is, not what he thinks it is. I don't know if I believe this. Well, you better find out what you believe. Because it says it all over this book. It's all over this book. He is a loving, just, merciful. His mercy triumphs over judgment. But we will all stand before a just, amazing, loving God. And we were given the wherewithal and the... Will you live life for you or live life for what you're called to do? Watch this video. Question. What are you called to do? I ask that question because we won't be judged according to what we did in life, but rather what we were called to do in life. Imagine with me standing before the throne of God and a scenario like this occurred. Evangelist Anderson, come forth and give an account of your stewardship on earth. E- evangelist Anderson, I, I'm not an evangelist. I, I, I'm an accountant. I, 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 I had an accounting firm. I had an evangelist Anderson. Where are the 347,566 souls I called you to impact in Asia, son? Where are they? I'm an, I'm an accountant. I, I had an accounting firm. I, I, I help churches. I help ministries with their, their, their finances. Son, where are the 347,566 souls in Asia I called you to impact? Son, where are they? Had you sought me, had you sought my face, I would have revealed this to you. And everything in regards to that man's call burned up before the judgment seat of Christ. Accountant Jones, step forward and give an account of your stewardship. Uh, Accountant Jones? No, no, I'm not. I pastored for 35 years. I I, I had a a membership of 750 people. Accountant Jones, 
I called you to the marketplace. Had you done this, you would have significantly impacted two people. You and those two men would have helped churches with their finances, and those churches would have impacted 751,321 souls. If you would have sought me, I, I would have revealed this to you. And again, in regards to this man's calling, everything he's done in life would be burned up before the judgment seat of Christ. Sister Smith, come forth and give an account of your stewardship. I only raised three children. I, I never preached to, to nations. I, I never even been on a, a missionary trip. I, I only tried my hardest to raise my children in your way. Sister Smith, I never called you to preach to nations. I never called you to go to other countries on missionary trips. I called you to raise three children. And let me show you one million five hundred seventy nine thousand five hundred forty one souls those three children impacted you saw me and you heard my voice you were obedient to my call well done my good and faithful servant Enter into the joy of your Lord. So remember, in regards to the calling that's on your life, you won't be judged according to what you did. You will be judged according to what you were called to do. Would you stand to your feet all over this room? 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run but only one gets the prize run in such a way to get the prize everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training they do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever therefore I do not run like a man aimlessly I do not fight the air no, I beat my body and make it my servant so that after I have preached to others, I will not just be disqualified from the prize. This is our call, folks. We are not just aimlessly walking through life. On this earth, people race hard for a trophy that they'll sit on a shelf. But as we run this life, we're doing it for a crown that will echo through all eternity. The Bible says in Revelations that when we get to heaven, we're going to lay our crowns at his feet. I love that he's given me so much, but I want to get a reward in heaven that I can hand back to him. I want to stand before him and say, read that book, God. Read the book of Jeremy. Because God, every day I pressed into you and I said, yes, I said, yes. And God, I did it because of your mercy. I did it because of your grace. I did it because of your loving kindness. Maybe right now, look, I, I even told our team, I said, I, I guarantee there will be some people that during this series, they change their whole life. That video will mess you up. Realizing that you could be spending your whole life doing something that is of no value in eternity. Why work hard if it ends after these 80 years? why not run like a man or a woman winning the prize come on i'm gonna run hard after the race that god has for me life is not a race to the biggest seat in the house it's a race to my seat i don't care what seat you're in it's a race to my seat what is the seat 
God has called you to on this earth. What does God want to do with your life? See, in this series, that's the hope that at the end of this, we're not going to press into a man or a woman to find our call or our talent. Because some talents that God wants to give you are waiting for you to step out. Maybe right now you're in the perfect will of God and you could say like Jesus, man, I am following the will of the Father. The will of the Father always doesn't lead to the path of least resistance. A lot of times it leads to closed doors that you got to knock on. Some doors that God wants to open, you got to step up to for them to open. I don't know what door God has for you. In, in other words, I can't really give that to you. But God wants to give it to you. He wants to sit down with you. The book he's written about your life. You know what he says about that book? I have promises in there for you. Plans for you. Plans of good, not evil. Plans of, plans of joy. Come on, I, I, got, I, got, I got a hope for you and a future for you. And, you know why we get sad in these moments? Because we've made idols of our plans. So like, God, I got to give up this book? No, no, it's not a give up. It's a get to. The Bible calls it a treasure in the field. A man sees this treasure and he knows it's there. He knows it's way more valuable than the field. So he goes and he sells everything he has to purchase the field so that he could get the field. No, so he could get the treasure in the field. It's a trade up, not a trade down. When you hand your life that you've made to God and say, God, my life was one thing, but God, I want the life you have for me. I want the call you have for me. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be on any stage you don't want me on. I don't want to be in any area you don't want me in. God, I want to, I want to, I want to walk. Look, the Bible says narrow is the path that leads to life. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. It's not easy to find. You're going to have to find it on your knees. You're going to have to find it in his presence. You're going to have to hear it from him. So that when all man doubts you, you can know that you know that you know that God called you to do what's in front of you. And if God called you to it, he's going to sustain you in it. For me, I don't want to get in on any plane. God hasn't called me to go speak to a city or a nation. I don't want to, I don't want to put myself in any place he hasn't called me to. Because in that place, I will have to sustain myself there. And I'm not strong enough. I want to be living a life that God is the one that's sustaining me. God is the one that's called me to it. Look, don't let offense, don't let hurt, don't let your past get in the way of your future. I know that that was wasted. I know it didn't work out, but failure is not final. If God's called you to it, even if it dies, he'll resurrect it. Fearless Online Church. Man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deeds. This church is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. In fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on, somebody, that's a lot of food. We, we gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, uh, pretty much the modern day uh, version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending in a sense to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life that no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more no matter how much I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their hearts so God can meet their spiritual need. Would you help us do that? 
We want to give out more clothing. We want to give out more food. We want to touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out 4 million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? Would you become a partner today? Everything in life to get anywhere really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth, who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life, that love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're gonna partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the Fearless Partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are gonna sow into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed the stream as much as I did. Again, if you are new and this is your first time, text the word FEARLESS to the number down below so we can stay connected with you throughout the week. See you guys next week.